Sorry we're late, everyone. Uh, welcome to this September 23rd regular meeting of the West Orange Board of Education. Mr. Calabano. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, I have a motion for consideration of the closed and public meeting minutes of August 26th and September 12th. I'll make that motion. I'll second. With, with revisions, right? Ms. With the revisions, yeah. the yes. Revision? That John identified, yeah. That uh, stands for identified. Mrs. Merklinger? Yes. Mr. Robertson? Yes. Mrs. Trick Scales? Yes. Vice President Mordecai? Yes. President Alper? Yes. Okay, uh, it's time for our student liaison uh, report. We're going to welcome our new liaisons, uh, Sinai Danny and Darlene Folas. Uh, welcome, we're glad to have you on board. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. It's all yours. Um, just a little introduction. Hi, my name is Sinai Dani. Um, I'm a junior here at the high school. Uh, I participate in a lot of activities and uh, just to name a few, track, um, RTC, uh, now I'm a Mountaineer mentor, and among other things, I'm an AP scholar. Uh, my name is Darlene Folos. I'm a senior at the high school. Just like Sinai, I'm also an ROTC cadet. I, serve on the, I served on the Nkiona Badlani Foundation as its president. I'm a mentor as well, and a part of the varsity girls tennis team. Um, we just wanted to uh, bring upon like, some updates from last year. Uh, we knew that there was um, uh, GPS tracking that we uh, that was allotted from the budget last year for the buses, and we just wanted to ask um, like how it was being installed and how it was being like followed upon. Um, what will this app like have? Like what capabilities will it have for the students as well as the parents, and how, um, who will be able to use it? Um, uh, the next item on our report, uh, we've begun surveying our student body. Our first concern was busing, so creating updates and feedback um, on students and their experience with the buses. We began with paper ballots and have also begun to use electronic forms to collect feedback on that. We are still in the, in the initial phases, but we've also began to collect feedback on overall concerns and comments from students. We are still in the initial stages, but we've noticed some trends of what the students are interested in, and we'd love to share that at the next meeting. Um, another thing that we wanted to improve upon is, uh, as Board of Ed liaisons for the entire district, we wanted to be more representative of the middle school uh, population, because as they are gonna become the new um, incoming high schoolers, and maybe even the new incoming Board of Ed liaisons, um, we wanted to get their position on certain things uh, that the board uh, proposes for the students, and we wanted to be more representative of how like their um, positions are on uh, new uh, uh, procedures or things that may be uh, implemented by the board. Yes, yeah, so as I said, we want to get a more direct and clear voice of not just the student body at the high school, but to include the middle schoolers as well. In addition, another update about the high school specifically, we led our Green Ribbon Week, which was a success. Working with the Grassroots Community Foundation, we were able to launch a commitment to mental health. Uh, we had a yoga day outside that was attended by students, and this is just a reminder of our commitment to not just the students' voices, but their wellness and, uh, as a whole. Uh, another thing uh, that we did uh, as a student body was we uh, this many students and um, clubs and activities and participate in this uh, the annual the ninth annual Nikhil walk and run uh, some um, some organizations that uh, participated were the Mountaineer mentors and the RTC uh, group that participated um, the Mountaineer mentors actually won the um, the most participants from a single team and uh, we raised I think close to $45,000 for the Nikhil Foundation. Um, those are just a few things that uh, the student body has participated in and helped um, like, uh, impact our community. And we just wanted to bring that up to your attention. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Hit on the GPS. 
Sure. And anything else? Sure. Uh, I'd like to welcome our student liaisons. Uh, we've had an opportunity to chat on a couple of occasions and meet um, outstanding young folks. And we're happy to have you up here and look forward to working with you. Um, yeah, so just an update on the GPS. So we, we have um, installed the, the Zonar devices on uh, all of uh, the district buses and uh, working with our, um, our vendors to do the same with theirs. Um, we have all this, the high school student IDs uh, we purchased uh, to equip them with the, the chip or the, that's necessary for it to function with the Zonar device. And we're currently in the process of planning for a, a pilot at the high school for later in the year, once we've had an opportunity to coordinate those details. Basically, the capacity that it gives above and beyond what we have currently, which is that the transportation office can track the exact location of where buses are. What this will add is an additional capacity for us to know when students have gotten on, if they've gotten on, and when they've gotten off, where they got on, and where they got off. Okay, so in the event that we were missing a student or something of that nature, we'd be able to know whether they got on the bus at all, when they got off, where they got off. So that's essentially the capacity. And we look forward to working with our student liaisons to kind of help plan that out a little bit and foresee any challenges we might encounter. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Yeah, go ahead. I'd like to add my welcome, but, but I also have um, a question. Did you get a copy of the student liaison policy from the board? Uh, yes, we have. Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure you have that. Um, I'm glad to hear about Yoga Day. I know last year a few parents came to the microphone and board members mentioned it as well. We talked about mindfulness. We haven't come to that as yet with our new superintendent. So I'm glad to hear about the Yoga Day and um, maybe mindfulness is another thing that we can look at this year. Dr. Casco, <laughs> thank you. And um, Ms. Mordecai, I mentioned mindfulness at our last board meeting yeah. and talked to Dr. Cascone because that's extremely important for adults. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's important for everyone to be in the moment. Um, and I too just want to welcome you two young people. It, it just, I'm just sitting here beaming. <laughs> yeah. You're just so bright. And um, we are thrilled to have you join us this year and we certainly look forward to your insights because you know what's happening. We think we know what's happening. You know. Maybe we should do mindfulness for the district next time. Last year we had a school board session where all the we board members yeah. participated in, in mindfulness was, and we came back to the board. So maybe we should do that as a board. That'd be great. <laughs> sure. Anything? Just welcome. <laughs> I've had the, the pleasure of actually met known you for years, but both, met both of you before at ROTC and aware that you're already, uh, already superstars. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to seeing you on the track as well. Thank you, sir. Improving that time every year. Um, but welcome and thank you for your insights. Thank you for the work you did coming into your first day. And uh, we really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to welcome both of you. Um, I've seen you guys working hard all summer. Uh, at since I have the girls working out on the track, and you guys are running on the track and at the tennis court. So you guys are definitely a, a great addition to have. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Dr. Cascon, superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Alper. Uh, just before I get into the, the formal items that are noted on the agenda, um, I just want to uh, touch on a couple of things. Um, we've had a, a busy start to school um, by uh, much of the feedback that I've received from you know, various groups of stakeholders, it's been a, a very positive um, and smooth opening to the school. A number of folks have said to me that this is the smoothest opening they've seen in years. So that uh, is very pleasing to me as a superintendent. Because uh, ultimately that's uh, what I'm trying to accomplish, is create an environment that's, uh, that's smooth and efficient for our staff and our students. I had an opportunity to attend a number of back to school nights. Um, two elementary back to school nights um, and uh, both middle school back to school nights. The buildings looked amazing. A um, lot of great parent turnout. We had some students that were there serving as volunteers to give tours. Um, and it really just filled me with a lot of pride uh, to see all that coming together um, for, you know, to start the school year off. Um, obviously the fall sports season is in full swing. A lot of great stuff going on there. Too much to really mention. 
though I have to give a shout out to the boys soccer team that won two one in overtime. That was pretty exciting. Um, and our band, our band had a had a banner weekend. In fact, um, they participated in two competitions: one at uh, Scotch Plains and one in Jefferson, and they took first in both. So, a uh, big round of applause for our uh, our band. Fantastic job. Um, you know, this was um, I had a, I had a great uh, great Saturday up here in West Orange. Kind of ducked out from my my you know my family time and came up here and was just uh, amazed by um, our PTAs at work. Um, there were uh, several PTA events that were going on. Uh, we had two car washes. I was able to make it to the Gregory car wash, and uh, the Hazel Carnival. Just again to our PTAs, thank you. Um, amazingly hardworking folks, you know, and doing what they can to, to raise money for our schools. So it was really nice to visit those events. And I also had the honor of attending the um, the, the uh, Hispanic Heritage uh, Foundation, West Orange Hispanic Heritage Foundation's flag raising ceremony. It was a really nice event. We got treated to some uh, amazing dance and music. And it was just great to be there with our town partners and acknowledging that month and acknowledging, you know, our um, our Latino uh, brothers and sisters, hermanos, hermanas in our town and the diversity of our great country. Um, just a, a note, high school back to school night is this Thursday. That promises to be a, uh, a great event. Uh, now uh, switching over to kind of more of the facility side, which will be a good segue um, when we invite Mr. Tsigi up here to do his presentation on the summer projects. Um, you will notice that on the agenda tonight there is a, a proposed uh, facilities evaluation on which the board will be voting. And um, this facilities evaluation was uh, proposed and determined um, after a comprehensive analysis and evaluation by Mr. Ziggy himself in terms of what had already been done in the way of evaluations, as well as taking stock of what evaluations had been performed both through the previous ESIP project as well as the previous work that was done by the architects. And so um, th what that did was it ensured um, that there is not redundancy in this additional evaluation that's being conducted and as was explained last time so that we can really be operating from an informed and comprehensive perspective to deliberate on what is necessary for a referendum. So just to clarify that again and that will be voted on tonight by the board. An update on the air structure. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to let you know that we were able to successfully negotiate through the conflict that existed between the, um, the, the manufacturer of the bubble and the contractors, um, and that work is uh, moving forward, and uh, we are on target for delivery of the lockers, I believe, by mid-October, and that facility should be fully operational within several weeks, so we're, we're pleased that that's been uh, moved forward. Um, just moving on to the formal part of the agenda as far as district goals, the, district, the process of setting our district goals um, really started when you know I came into district and was listening to various groups of stakeholders about um, perceptions and needs. Um, we, as a public work session with the board, we developed some rough ideas for district goals. Through our leadership team meeting over the summer, we kind of f further threshed those out, and the goals that appear on the agenda is really the end result of that work, and there are five of them. Um, and not to read them verbatim, but they connect to uh, communication, uh, perception, student achievement and access, uh, social emotional well-being and learning for students, and then the generation of additional revenue. And all of them will be um, smart goals in that we will utilize surveys and things of that nature pre and post to determine the extent to which we've achieved those. So excited to get started on those um, and um, a lot of great work to come. Um, so with that, um, I will turn it over to Mr. Alper to talk a little bit about the same process that was followed for the board goals. Mr. Alper? Sure. Uh, very similar. I think we actually started in the same workshop meeting. We did district goals and board goals alongside our uh, representative from the New, Jer New Jersey School Boards Association, uh, Charlene Peterson, who you would have seen here uh, in another meeting where we further teased them out and discussed them and came up with really, you know, what we thought they needed to be. So. Uh, we're going to vote on ours tonight, board goals, and the three of them concern uh, our work with policies, um, our work with data, uh, the quality and quantity of it that we receive and work with, um, a PR plan, and a fourth one that's not on the agenda but that we'll read out when we get to it uh, on just professional development uh, for the board as an ongoing process. So we're excited to get that underway. You know, uh, board goals are optional, I think, and come out of the board. Uh, they come out of the board evaluation process. But it's one of those things that you really look for in a school board that you're focused and working together on common goals. Thank you, Mr. Alpha. Yep. Um, and so, just a quick preamble 
to Mr. Ziggy. Um, you know, as I as I toured the buildings this summer, and I um, was uh, became aware, and Mr. Ziggy and his staff showed me the projects that they were doing. I thought it was really important that at this board meeting that uh, Mr. Ziggy had an opportunity to present to the board and the public um, all the the work that his staff, um, the projects that his staff got done this summer. When you see it, I think you'll be amazed at how much was done in such a short period of time. Mr. Ziggy, board, if you'll uh, join me in the audience. Yeah, that's better. That's good. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I don't get this opportunity uh, very often to thank my staff. Uh, without uh, the buildings and grounds, people who are behind me, I facilitate trying to get all this work done in a short period of time in the 10 weeks that we have. Many people think we have 10 months, but it's only 10 weeks. So uh, what we get done is amazing. Uh, Mike Hanley, who's our operations foreman, and Kathleen McCormick keep our office together. Uh, every one of our head custodians, custodial supervisors, maintenance and custodians do a fabulous job. And their best interest of the staff and students are always in the forefront to keep uh, everything going. So uh, the, the presentation, I, I put together about 50 slides. I could put 500 together. But it just gives you a flavor for what goes on in the district and what we've done uh, with the, um, the monies that are available to us. Um, in the high school in room 20, 2301, we rent, renovated this room. Uh, we cut the classroom in half and, and put an office in the back space there. Uh, there's the office from one side. Uh, it's a learning area. That's the coach's office there. And then a learning area for the students on the other side. Um, air conditioning ventilated properly so that uh, that room could be self-sufficient. Uh, roof replacements. Uh, we did over uh, the 43 100 wing uh, where we had quite a bit of uh, problems with uh, uh, leaking uh, ceiling tiles and so forth. That has now been abated, so that's behind us with a, a new roof. This is one of the uh, foam insulation roofs that we started with the ESIP program and are continuing now with uh, all of our roof repairs and any roof replacements in the future. You can see from another angle. That lower roof was done. Half of that roof was ripped off with the wind. Uh, we got that part of the roof replacement. That was the capital money that we had this year uh, to do some roofs and electrical upgrades. Trailers. Finally, the trailers are gone, at least in two schools. Hey, big, big project there. Uh, the Redwood School now has a larger parking lot. We're uh, looking into developing that into an area where we can uh, move the traffic a little bit better for the students uh, when they drop off in the morning and they pick up in the afternoon. So uh, there's the parking lot from the entrance angle. And then the back kiss and go lane we were able to do this year without expending capital funding. Uh, we had a contractor who was able to do it part of our um, upgrades to our asphalt and concrete. We spent about $125,000 district-wide on all of our asphalt and concrete repairs. That's about been the average of uh, the last uh, 10 years. And there's the opposite side where we come out and we'll go out onto the, uh, the side street there. Okay, there's another area where we put, this is gonna be where uh, the Gaga pit that's down in the back, in the back um, uh, playground area, which we don't use that often because it's on the grass, is gonna be moved up to the front there and the kids are going to be able to play in a consolidated area where they have other uh, playground equipment there. So I'll show you that picture. Uh, restroom uh, partitions, we've been doing these over the years. Uh, we were able to get some money this year to do Redwood and St. Cloud. So you can see the big difference in the stalls that are put in the bathroom really spruces up the bathroom and um, again, gets rid of those metal partitions that <clears throat> weren't so good. Okay, some fence replacements that we did. Uh, being a good neighbor, we uh, removed some trees there that were ready to fall on our cars and into our neighbor's um, uh, side lot there. So uh, we did some fence repairs, some drainage uh, and asphalt. This was a lot of the work that we did with our asphalt and concrete. Uh, the drains, when they start to collapse, we get them rebuilt and then we put the uh, asphalt finish around them. This is where we had a flood again in uh, Kelly School, not as bad as we had years ago when we put up our floodgate in the back, but we found that uh, because of the torrential rain, uh, the waters came in to that area. Oh, let me get back here. Uh, back in the area, I guess you can't see it with the point there. There's a point there. Right here, we added this drain here, and we added this wall, and we put a canopy over the top. Now the water can't go in through the back entrance. 
Mother Nature finds its way. We fixed the one side with the floodgate several years ago, so now we have it all protected, so that won't happen again where we flood out our basement at Kelly. Uh, some, uh, <clears throat> some of the carpeting, we were able to get 24 rooms this year, a little over $100,000 that we spent in carpeting and floor tile replacements in the district. Uh, Liberty, we, get, we finally finished up the rest of the bleachers. It took us uh, three years to get them all done, but you can see now there are no broken uh, benches and when people sit, they're comfortable. Okay, the retaining wall at Mount Pleasant. We started out with a small portion down at the end. This is another three-year project. Um, and we now hopefully have our uh, frozen sidewalks uh, resolved for the future, okay? so. Um, it did work. We wanted to do a, little, a small portion. It did uh, succeed where it went down into the drain and uh, under the stone. And so we came up about another 125 feet. So I think we've got it solved until it goes further up. So we'll see. Again, some asphalt for where the kids used to play in the grass. Now they could play on asphalt with the, with the playground equipment. We added air conditioning in the kitchen at uh, St. Cloud, one of the last um, kitchens that we had to add so the kitchen staff are very happy now and they can cook and supply the food in a pleasant atmosphere again some overlays and again this is what we do we can't afford to do complete driveway so we do portions at a time that are worst case scenarios and uh, we end up with large patched areas with uh, which serve the purpose as you can see in the front there um, that was done last year and that was done the year before. So uh, in three years, we ended up getting the entire driveway done. Uh, St. Cloud, we ended up having to replace parts of the boiler system. This is the condensate return uh, tank. That's the holding tank. The um, heat exchanger sprung a leak last year and we replaced the, um, the air dryers. That project was $90,000 just to do that work. So it's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that everybody doesn't see, but it's essential in keeping our buildings warm and keeping the boiler system functional. Okay, another part of the roof, the second roof replacement was done at St. Cloud. This was over the kitchen area and the hallways where we had extensive leaks, and that roof was um, replaced also with the foam roofing. Again, some more partitions in St. Cloud School. Uh, the back stairs at St. Cloud that were refinished, that were falling apart. And the parents are the driving forces behind a lot of these things that they say need to be get done. So we put them on the agenda and uh, we, we get the money for it and then we get, we get it done. There, Gregory School, trailers are gone. Hooray, there's two. Okay, so that open field. And what we did was the walkway, the original walkway is down the left side here comes down the steps goes down and goes in the front we had a walkway that came up this way as you know around the trailers we decided to make the walkway to the left side and move the the uh, as remove the asphalt so that the field now can be extended so when the grass grows in as you can see it's already growing after several weeks and we get some rain hopefully we'll be able to uh, get a nice um, uh, finished field there so the kids can expand uh, for their play area I guess in the future we can talk about expanding the playground or moving it, relocating. So well, we'll be talking with the PTAs to help us with that. Again, grass areas. We did a lot of the areas that were not part of the, we had a very good contractor on this right to the last minute they got it done, but um, they did a lot of areas that were not in where the trailers were and they did uh, areas and, and seeded and, and put the um, straw uh, bales over the top. Okay, some of the floors, we went to this LVT tile now that doesn't need wax. Uh, it's been a very, very good product, our second year using it. So, uh, like I said, 24 rooms were done this year for, with, the, uh, with the flooring, as you could see. Some of the concrete work, you see the whiter patches, those are concrete replacements that we do. We're going to be filling in a lot of the areas with some topsoil in the fall. Uh, and we'll clean up those areas so uh, the walkway is uh, safe and passable. Fire alarm system. We replaced the entire fire alarm system at Hazel School. We try to do one a year, uh, another $40,000 project, but uh, we replaced the entire system, which include all the heat detectors and smoke detectors in the building, all the pull stations, and uh, the system is complete now. So now we have an updated programmable system so that when the fire alarm does go off, where the fire department has to come in, they know exactly where uh, the trouble spot is because now they all are addressable. As you can see, the number on there, uh, the number at the top there, 133, that is on the panel. They know exactly where it's at. So our 
whole goal is to get the entire district that way. Okay, bus garage, we have an office renovation. All these renovations were done with our in-house staff, very, very talent, ma talented maintenance staff that we have. We don't need to go with outside contractors, so we save a lot of money. We get the best bang for our buck, and we're able to do these uh, inclusive of the windows uh, and, and everything, even the doors. The flooring is done by an outside contractor, but you can see uh, this was our biggest project. This took, uh, took us six weeks most of the summer. Uh, we did four four uh, classrooms, well, actually five classrooms down in the basement of Washington. As you can see on top of those, we actually ripped out all the walls and then restudded them. Uh, we thought we had a mold problem, but when we ripped it all out, we had no mold problem. We had all uh, paneling uh, in those uh, classrooms, and when we pulled it off, um, we found that there wasn't mold, but again, basements lend itself to moisture, and so we refinish. So as you can see at the bottom, you can see the difference in the classroom. Everything is uh, newly sheetrocked, okay? You can see the old on top, okay, and the new on the bottom. Okay, this is B7. This is our, our one room downstairs, and you can see the difference at the bottom down there. Tremendous difference. It also helped with our little rodent friends that come in. We found a lot of holes behind the walls that we couldn't get to because of furniture. That was all ripped out, so we're in constant IPM mode in trying to get our um, little friends outside and keep the students happy inside. Uh, playground repairs and upgrades, we're constant with that. We have a, um, an, inspection that comes in, an inspection company that comes in each year, and you can see the mulch that was put down and all the repairs that are done for each of our playgrounds. And that's the presentation. Thank you. I'll be here to answer any questions, so I'll stay around. Ms. Triggs-Gales, you want to start off? Thank you, Mr. Ziggy, and your phenomenal staff. Um, when you talk about the fact that your maintenance crew has done a lot of this work, that's very impressive. Um, I come from a, a dad who worked for the Nort Board of Ed. He was uh, foreman of the painters, so I kind of have a, a thing about facilities, and so I'm very impressed. Um, and I know the drainage issue at Mount Pleasant and Gregory and Kelly, I, I know those principals and parents and students are just thrilled that that's been taken care of. Um, the 24 floors, tell me a little bit more about um, the composite, what, what's used for that? You said it was something new. The VCT, which is vinyl composite tile, we now moved into the realm of uh, LVT, which is a pre-finished tile that does not need to be stripped or waxed. Wow. Uh, so that saves us a lot of time, especially toward the end of the summer when you have to have the floors dry in time with the, um, uh, the onset of the floor installation. Uh, we save a couple of the days there where we can move the furniture in. Uh, we don't have to worry about uh, burnishing because the wax uh, needs to be a little bit hardened so that our furniture doesn't stick to it. So it's a time saver that way. And in the future, we're hoping that we don't have to uh, wax or um, spend stripper or and the time to uh, strip those floors. So it's a time saver right. there. So you said that the, the ultimate goal would be to replace all well, of the classroom floors? Yes, well, the all the classroom floors, as we go along, as they need to be replaced, this is going to be our product. We tried it for two years now. Uh, it seems to work very well. The custodians like it, so um, that's the way we're going to go. So that's a, a saver for us. A little bit more expensive than the VCT, about 10% uh, more, but it's worth it in the long run because we're going to save in the maintenance down, down the line. I'm always uh, curious to see how... Well, I guess we don't use salt now on our sidewalks. We use the whatever we uh, use. The magnesium, yeah. Right, right. How that interacts with the new floors. Um, I've seen some really odd chemical reactions. <laughs> That's for sure, on, yes. On new floors and... Uh, What'd you say, magnesium? What are... uh, magnesium chloride, that's what we use right now. So we don't use the salt anymore that's friendly yeah. to the grass, uh, friendly to the interior. It doesn't uh, create the chemical um, uh, hazards that uh, oh, that does. So, And okay. we had good experience with those last year and no, no adverse effect. 
Fabulous. Again, thank you so very, very You're welcome. much. Ms. Mordecai. Hi, Mr. Siggy. Thank you for that. Um, very, very impressive presentation, and thank you to your team. I have a couple questions. I'm going to piggyback on one of uh, Ms. Trickscale's comment um, about the floor. You mentioned that in the long run it will save us money. Is this a part of your sustainability green school training? Yes. Thank you for that. Yes. We're hoping to bring back the sustainability committee. Um, he was one of the many administrators that took that five-day program. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to hear that it's animal, grass, plant friendly yes. and everything. So that's good. Um, I, I, I'm a little amazed that there's anything that needs to be fixed in Liberty. It's our newest school. What is it, 12, 13 years old? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wondering why there's anything that needs to be fixed. I'm expecting always to hear our older schools that are 75 or 100 years old, but never Liberty. Uh, well, again, we keep up during the year. We did uh, just this summer 686 uh, work orders uh, district wide, and That's quite a, a few work. work orders were done. At, and again, it's upkeep, it's maintenance, nothing new that we have to do there because the building is relatively new uh, since 2005. So, uh, nothing major there. Yeah, thank you. That's a lot of work 686. Um, for the high school roof replacement, you mentioned the 4300 wing um, ceiling tiles. This was done under ESIP. It, there should be Not a guarantee. Not that section. That section was Not never done. Not the 4300 wing? Nope, nope. We ran out of money there. So there was okay. one section of the roof that wasn't done, and that was the one. Okay. In your presentation, I'm pretty sure you said that it was done by, it was done by the ESIP. Uh, alluded to the fact that the foam roofs were started with the ESIP, and we continued with the foam okay, roofs. Okay. So uh, this wasn't forward. one of the ESIP roofs. Correct. Because I was going to say there should be a guarantee. But it was the foam roofs that we used based on the concept that we employed okay. uh, at that time. Okay. Um, the Redwood Kiss and Go Lane, thank you for that. I know several years ago we had a tragedy in that school district, in that yes. Alton School area, so that's great. Um, thank you. You're thank welcome. you so much. Good job. Thanks. Mr. Robertson. Just thank you and your team for all your hard work, and uh, I'm very happy to see that the retaining wall at Mount Pleasant. Is up and we're you know we'll cross our fingers on uh, on the ice this winter and hope we don't have the same problem again but it looks beautiful and Good. I appreciate all the hard work I'm just curious and kind of piggybacking on one of the things that Ms. Mordecai said um, what are some of the other uh, green approaches that we're that we're taking as we uh, as we do our renovations um, anything that's uh, non chemicals that we're using we've gone for years now at this probably our 10th year going green with chemicals um, all our cleaning products, uh, are, we stay away from a stripper. We only use stripper, and I hand that out very sparingly mm -hmm. uh, on our more difficult floors and, and the whiter floors to uh, get them clean. So we try to stay away from there. Um, our waxes are, are all uh, biodegradable and uh, are mm -hmm. user-friendly or environmentally friendly. Mm -hmm. So from there, uh, even our road salt, uh, uh, we try to keep away from the grass areas and, sure. and do a good job with that. So. Uh, those are some of the, the paints are all uh, non-toxic paints now. Uh, there's no odors, very low grade uh, VOCs, VOCs uh, mm -hmm. or almost zero. Uh, so again, um, you know, those are all the things we're trying to do. Always thinking of, of things to do. Uh, went to fiber mops instead of the um, uh, the cloth mops now. So. Uh, uh, those those have been a, a tremendous uh, help for us. We we launder them all. All of our um, schools have. Um, it's almost like a laundromat. They have a, a washing machine, mm -hmm. and then the guys dry them out. So uh, we buy them detergent, and we save a lot of money there because we don't have to rebuy them again. So right. uh, all those those thoughts of doing Excellent. things, uh, you know, to save money and also to be be green. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great, Ms. Merkelberg. I just want to thank you and your team. Um, there's some of the nicest people I've ever run into uh, in my runs and work around town. So thank you to all of them and yourself as well for thank that. You. Um, I'm happy to see the trailer has gone from Gregory because I have fond memories of playing in that huge field. So I'm glad the kids will have that open space again. Um, just a real quick question about the roof repairs at the high school and at St. Cloud. I know that's something we've talked about with the architects. Are there any further plans for additional roofing to be done with this foam? Um, only if they, we can't get it done with the architects, then we'll have to try to plan to do some more. Uh, we do have some more roofs that need to be done. 
Uh, what I didn't show here, uh, it's still on the agenda, but the rest of the capital money, we're going to be doing some electrical upgrades at the high school. One of the areas in the PVW, uh, the whole electrical room is going to be redone. Um, all those federal breakers are going to be taken out of there, and uh, we're probably not, not probably a little late in doing it, but we haven't had any disasters now. Uh, those uh, circuit breakers need to be exercised, and they haven't. So uh, we're probably going to get started at the end of October, the beginning of November. Uh, we had asked the contractor to give us some better pricing, and he was able to do that by moving the project from the summer to the late fall or early winter. So we're going to do that over the winter time, probably late October, early November, and we saved about $10,000 by doing that. So, uh, you know, we'll get that electrical upgrade plus some distribution panels. So we're not going to have redundancy with the electrical. With the, with the engineers, we'll be able to get the high school completely upgraded for electrical distribution, which is, is a positive. Okay. And so just to follow up on that, you said that's the Pleasant Valley Way gym, correct? What's that? The PV, uh, PVW gym? PVW electrical closet and, oh, and upgrades okay. there, yeah, not okay. the gym. Not no. the gym. Okay. The gym is okay right now. We have okay. electrical. The distribution there is fine. It's other areas of the building that we need a better distribution. Oh, thank you. All right. Liaisons? Uh, I just wanted to thank you and say thank you for um, your hard work that you guys have put into the school district. Uh, like improving the school, uh, the schools for all the students, and um, for your initiatives to go green. Um, I just had one question. I know um, in previous years the Washington School Elementary School has had a retainer wall that has been broken, uh, similar to the one at Mount Pleasant. Um, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, was not put in the budget for last year, for this year, I guess. Uh, but are there any plans to put it in the budget for this year, uh, going into next year? We keep moving along in that direction, and our overall plan with the architect is we'll address that. So hopefully we're going to be part of that uh, future plan. Yes. All right. Thank you. And no further questions. Great. Mr. Ziggy, thank you. I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ziggy. Appreciate that. Um, there is actually no HIV report. I'm happy Great. to report that we do not have any HIVs to date in September. <laughs> that may be a non-summer first. That's excellent. That's a... <laughs> All right. Uh, questions from the public on agenda items. If you have a question or comment on anything that's on the agenda, come on up. You'll have three minutes. Just let us know your name and address. Not sure if that was enough. Seeing none, we'll close that portion out. And may I have a motion for personnel, items one through six. I'll make a motion. I'll second. All right, any discussion? Just, uh, I'll take a. Yes. Go ahead. Ahead. No, go ahead. No. Just want to say uh, thank you for the 22 years of service uh, to Janine Aldrich, and, and uh, wow, it's a long time. And just thank you for your contribution and enjoy retirement. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Mr. Calavana? Mrs. Merklinger? Yes. Mr. Robertson? Yes. Mrs. Trigg Scales? Yes. Vice President Mordecai? Yes. And I'm abstaining from Dave Joyce uh, under personnel uh, transfers, uh, item number five, letter A. And President Alper. Yes. Okay. Next up, curriculum and instruction. Uh, items 1 through 10. Reminder on item 1 to abstain for your own reimbursement. Uh, or for your own approval, rather. Uh, may I have a motion for 1 to 10? I'll motion. I'll motion. I'll second. And abstain, of course. For mm -hmm. our Let me get to it. Any discussion? I'd like to make a motion to table item number seven and eight um, as I have requested further information on those items. Um, would appreciate a second. These two items we had discussed in December and again in January and then in April during the budget process. I would like to know why it again appears on this agenda and would like sufficient backup before I'm comfortable in voting for it. Um, so if this could be tabled to the next meeting, which is October 7th. I'd appreciate that. Mrs. Mordecai, if I, if I just, uh, we have Mr. Mendez here. Um, 
perhaps we could ask her, she might have the answers to those questions. Sure. Could we do that, Mr. Mendez? Yeah, that would be good. Hi, good evening. Uh, last year we began our work with uh, professional development in the area of ELA in order to uh, respond to the feedback of our staff. Our staff had completed various surveys through our listening sessions. They um, asked us for support with uh, professional development specifically around Readers and Writers Workshop. Um, the ask was not just to go to workshops outside of district or one day workshops, but to have a consultant actually come in come into the classroom's model, have the opportunity to observe that modeling with peers and then debrief and then work through uh, the professional learning that way. Uh, last year we began that work with our consultant um, and uh, received some additional feedback on next steps, things that they would like uh, to see uh, expanded upon, etc. So this would be a year two part of that goal specifically this year. Um, we are going to focus on professional development around unpacking our units of study as a resource. Um, just for a clarification point, we have curriculum in ELA that's developed. Uh, we have curriculum that we're revising, and the units of study are just supplementary. So when the teachers go to unpack those units of study, they're really going to look at what teaching points will they pull from the units of study. They'll see those modeled in those classrooms, and then they'll be able to debrief around them. Um, the reason that's very important is because we don't want the teachers to attempt to just use the units of study um, as a, a curriculum or from A to B to C to D as if it is um, the curriculum, right? We want them to be able to just pull out those teaching points, pull out mini lessons, pull out mentor text, pull out those things that are priority for the students. Um, a second area of focus would be um, uh, really looking at small group instruction. So what does your data say? You've been using Fontes and Pinnell, you've been using MAP, you've been using um, uh, the ELA, you know, the NJSLA assessments, you now know what your students can and can't do. You are um, giving formative assessment in your classroom. Uh, so now how do you use that data to pull small group instruction and really meet the individual student needs with very specific strategies and interventions? Um, another area that we'd like to um, focus on is conferring with students in the reading and writing workshop through the professional development. So what that means is as the teachers are uh, walking around the classroom and they are pulling up alongside of a student and they're sitting down with the student to confer, asking questions. Um, how are you approaching this uh, reading? How are you taking notes? Or how are you processing the comprehension? Or what areas are you struggling with? And they're asking the questions about um, the ELA aligned to the standards. And so then that's conferring and we need professional development in that area. Um, also with um, uh, the professional development will be provided to our reading specialists. We have reading specialists in our district. Um, they are very, very trained and experts in being able to provide services specific to the reading needs of the students. Um, and we are going to layer on top of that coaching. And so then our consultant will assist us with preparing our reading specialists with the ability that they have to really identify the needs of the students in the area of reading and the strategies. That's something that unique that they bring to our team. Now, how do they help support our teachers with that? How do they take that and translate it into really working with teachers and modeling with them and supporting them? They do this, um, and we just want to expand upon that. Um, another area is as we begin to revise our curriculum this year um, to uh, really look at grammar, which is our focus, uh, a priority area. We want to look at our resources, make sure that they're representative of our students, not only as a, 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 a window, but a mirror, right? We want to make sure we're looking at both ends uh, when we're aligning all of our resources to all of our new state mandates, and we're making sure that we are um, representing all of our student body, that we're representing all of our student body well, that there's no implicit bias, that there is um, no uh, discrimination or misrepresentation of any of our community groups. So we're going to be looking through our curriculum for all of those things. Um, these uh, PD sessions that are here, they are different days. I think it's 27 or 28 days, and the reason is because it's going to take place in each school. We're not pulling the teachers out. That's another priority of ours, not to pull the teachers out um, um, 
for all of their PD. Some teachers will be pulled out for some, but here we're going to go into the different schools and develop lab sites. So it will be a classroom that is working through the professional development, teachers observing in their homeschool setting, and it's familiar to them and they'll be able to, um, to really benefit. So that's the focus of the professional development plan um, for the consultant. We do have action plans for that, so we can forward those to you, Ms. Mordecai, and to the rest of the board with um, very specific objectives for each of the things that I've mentioned. Um, an action plan with activities, next steps, and measurable outcomes. How, what are we expecting to see at the end of this? Okay. Um, so, okay. So my question, well, I have questions in regard to what you've just said, but I also want to add on, um, we approved this uh, December 11th, 2018, and we spent $24,700 through Title IA, Title IIA, and Title IA. And then again, um, we reapproved it on the January 28th meeting. And then during our budget process, when I asked if there was any new curricula, you said there's nothing new in this budget. I remember that discussion well. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing new, nothing new to pay for. Now, some of the support that you just mentioned, we never got, at least I never got. I'll speak for myself, I never got. Um, you're saying that it's 28 days in each school. The, the PD plan we received, but not the action plan. The presentation you're making now should come before we vote, not after I've made a motion to table it. So this is a little cart before the horse with this being on the agenda. So I do appreciate um, your explanation, but it should come before it's on the agenda. Um, you also mentioned that you are Revising the curricula, revising the grammar, aligning to New Jersey learning standards, and um, you also mentioned coaching reading specialists. We just hired a reading specialist supervisor who came highly qualified, who I expected to be the one coaching, and not the PD person that was hired last December. So if you could explain that for me, um, I'd appreciate it. Sure. So the first uh, I think I heard was that um, we said we didn't have any new curriculum, and we during the budget during the during our budget cycle. Right, and, and this is not new curriculum, so maybe I'm not mis I'm not understanding. You said there's nothing new in the budget, no, no new curriculum, nothing to worry about. You're not expending any extra funds, but but this is new. Th this is this is new. This is PD for ELA that you're implementing, as well as the reading specialists. When we just hired a supervisor for reading specialist. I'm, I'm just not understanding what's on the agenda tonight. What's I feel on, it's duplicative. Okay, what's on the agenda tonight in numbers mm -hmm. items seven and eight are professional development for our staff. It's to meet our year two goals in the area of professional development. Um, it does not mean that there's new curriculum per se. It means that every year we're looking at our curriculum to make revisions and bring it up to our standard. So we're not um, developing new curriculum in totality as in we're getting rid of curriculum and adopting something new. What we do every five years as a part of our cycle and here in our ELA is um, we're considering the feedback we've received from our staff. Okay. We've, we're considering the observations that we've made as we go into um, our classrooms to see what the needs are to support our teachers with greater levels of resources. We've considered what our data has said. We've considered um, some of the items that uh, we heard last year that needed to be embedded into our curriculum, i.e. the grammar. And so then as a part of our normal revision process, which is what we do every year with curriculum, and so uh, every year we have um, a list, if you will, of curriculum that we revise or we um, yes, really just I take a look that. at. This and, is and a part of that work. And this includes the Lucy Calkins that you mentioned and this Last includes year. the resources, right, our resources, the so units this of is, study. Okay. Which is, which is. So this is the second year of Lucy Calkins, no. not the reading specialist. This is you're, our, con you're confused me when you mentioned the reading specialist, because the reading specialist is not on the agenda tonight. Because the reading specialist. Yeah, no, so. so you just, mentioned reading specialist. This PD is not for the reading specialist, because we hired somebody else. Correct. For the so let me, let me just, let me just interject a couple of things to maybe clarify. So. I think a couple things. So I think it's it's pretty well known that um, the the implementation of Readers Writers Workshop um, is needs to be 
uh, we need to wrap our arms around it. We need to ensure that all of our staff are adequately trained, they understand how to do it, and they're all operating from the same level of capacity. What I've heard, not only from teachers, but also from board members, is that this has been kind of an ongoing process that we've never really gotten up to speed. So I think on a very general, overarching, macro level, that's the rationale behind the PD that you see on the agenda tonight, is to continue to deliver professional development and learning to staff members so that they can more uh, more effectively and authoritatively implement Reader's Rare's workshop. Relative, and I believe that that was in, in the professional development budget that was approved um, last year. Now, in terms of the reading specialists, so this is nuanced. Um, presently, the reading specialists perform very traditional, perform in a very traditional kind of orthodox reading specialist role, which is really to deliver multi-sensory reading intervention to an individual student or small groups of students. Mm -hmm. And they will continue to do that predominantly. Mm -hmm. However, as they start to take on small coaching roles and start to build the capacity of classroom teachers to be able to better do that on their own, which in reality, all primary classroom teachers should be able to do. It's not their fault because typically they don't get a lot of training in multisensory reading in, they don't get OG training, for example. They don't get Wilson training as a matter of course in their elementary education degrees. They come into the classroom not really knowing how to do that unless they go back and they get a separate certification. So there's a, there's a, there's a dearth of capacity amongst our primary teachers to actually to be able to deliver multisensory training. So what are we starting to do? We're starting to equip our reading specialists. And yes, we did hire a K-5 literacy supervisor, and she's going to work very hard. But we have seven elementary schools and a lot of elementary teachers, and she's one person. So it's a fairly typical model to turnkey and to build capacity amongst teachers to serve additionally as additional trainers within the building and practitioners in the classroom whose classrooms teachers can go in to actually observe that happening. So I think that's the, is that not only are we going to train the classroom teachers, but we're going to upskill our reading specialists so that as they take on this coaching role, they're more equipped to do that, recognizing, final point, that that's going to be a sliding scale that's going to be skewed more towards traditional reading specialist behavior initially, but gradually, as our classroom teachers become more independent, that will shift slightly more towards the coaching model, recognizing that that one-on-one -on -one reading specialist intervention will never go away completely, because there's always going to be kids that really need that tier three intervention. So I hope that provides a little bit more clarity on the model and the rationale. Thank you for that explanation. I just wanted to add on, you mentioned Wilson training. We've had Wilson training in district. I know we're moving towards, and we've started, Orton-Gillingham training. So. We, do we no longer have Wilson, and we just specifically, we only have Orton Gillingham now, or, or do we, we have both? We have both. Um, okay. Wilson is a part of OG, and so. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I, if I might add, um, it would be remiss if we did not give the reading specialists the same training that we're giving the classroom teachers mm -hmm. with the readers and writers workshop. So we, we must do that mm -hmm. so that everyone is working off uh, the same script. Um, our elementary teachers spoke loudly last year about needing the units of study. And so we provided those and with that must come the professional development mm -hmm. so that they understand how to implement it efficiently and effectively for each student and for small groups. So, thank you. Thank you. My issue was not receiving the backup, the sufficient backup and explanation to vote on it tonight. That was my issue. But thank you for your explanation and Dr. Cascone as well. I, I, I might want to add that when I first got on the board, the ELA supervisor who started Reader's, Writing Work, Reader's Writers Workshop in 2011, who is no longer with us, um, Kudos to her because eight years later we're still using the program that she started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's a shame we, we haven't finished the training in eight years. Okay. Here's my, my challenge. And I understand, uh, and thank you for the, the in depth explanation. And Dr. Cascone as well, the idea that, you know, we, we provided the, uh, uh, the units of study 
last year that have been missing for about five years for elementary school teachers, um, or in this past year, right? Um, and I understand we need to train the classroom teachers and uh, both kind of upgrade and evolve our training of the reading specialist as they evolve into more coaches uh, so that they can help to continue to reinforce uh, uh, the, the, the PD with the teachers. And I also understand that we moved to, uh, for cost savings purposes and efficiency, moved to bringing trainers inside instead of going out to trainings, and that was a great move. I get all that. Here's where the, there's a little disconnect for me. We do have a new ELA supervisor. I understand she's just recently come on board um, and look forward to what she can do. Um, some of this, though, feels out of context for me because the truth is that while we theoretically have a five-year cycle for curriculum uh, uh, development and approvals, ELA I've seen changing dramatically and on and off, particularly for K-5 throughout the past few years, and we have struggled with the implementation of the Reader's Writer's Workshop, and I understand that this is part of the solution to that, right? I get that. The PD is supposed to address that. Um, at the same time, the board has never really had a presentation of that. Uh, the, the closest that the board had to a presentation of the most recent iteration of K-5 ELA curriculum was when the committee uh, did uh, its report and recommendations. And the challenge with the committee's report and recommendations is that no principals were involved. And I know personally that we had principals who had recommendations to how to better meet their own kids' needs uh, in grammar that weren't listened to. Um, parents weren't involved. So here we had um, the committee presentation with some recommendations. We never actually adopted it. So we've never actually adopted the ELA K-5 curriculum in some time, and we didn't have all the proper inputs for that. So I feel like we're kind of, we're fixing the train while it's moving a little bit. And what would help me as a board member, uh, I would like to consider approving this conditionally so that we can keep, the, keep things going, but I feel like it's out of context. Um, I've received, and thank you Dr. Cascone, a packet of data but I've never received the data analysis presentation. As much as I love data. Okay, so data analysis presentation, So because you're talking about the data that's driving how we uh, uh, address all these nuanced needs and how we address uh, small group learning and all that, right? We need the data presentation, we need a curriculum presentation, we need to actually adopt the curriculum, and we need, I need to like, still would like to see what happens with the input from the principals and parents with those comprehensive recommendations that the committee came back with. Because without the principal's input and their, uh, their understanding what's going on with their kids every day, and grammar has been, you know how I feel about that, complete failure in, in our district. The trying to do, uh, uh, kind of do it organically, and, and it just hasn't really worked. And this has come from high school teachers as well as from middle school and elementary school. So I'd like to be able to see these elements. Um, I'm okay with approving this tonight, but conditionally, that we as a board get those things that we're supposed to have to be able to approve these things in context, i.e. the data, the curriculum, and with all the necessary inputs, including from principals. On October 7th, you'll have a data presentation, and at the following October meeting, we're doing a curriculum presentation. And so um, we will be able to provide you with uh, those presentations and updates on our progress in curriculum, moving from uh, what the flow is for curriculum development in the district to what our curriculum projects are for the 2019-20 school year. Um, to what the professional development is that will accompany that to support our staff. I'd like to just reiterate that professional development is ongoing mm -hmm. um, and that uh, in, in all of our best practices, it's very important, I think, to continuously offer ongoing support to teachers in 
all of our professional development. Um, because each year the data may look different, each year the needs are different, and we need to grow. And so then as we are moving in our growth model, uh, what was really expeditious and meaningful in year one of implementation of any given model that might have been, let's say, five or eight years ago, um, today that looks very differently. Um, here, what we're seeing, and, and I appreciate the support on, on the conditional even, because we can uh, present uh, what we intend to do with this, but the teachers are really needing to have this support, and we want to be able to pres uh, provide it consistently over time, um, small, uh, bite-sized chunks that they can take and, and really make some actionable progress with. Okay. I, I'm not opposed to, de to PD. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure I had the backup sufficient to vote, but now the backup on the presentation is happening in the next meeting. Well, that presentation that, is curriculum overall. This yes, present, that's fine. This, this PD is, is just a part of our ELA plan. Yeah, but it's a part of the whole thing. You, you need a complete presentation. In, in, Thank in you. The, in the end, um, it's been, I placed it on the agenda. It's, it's been put before the board upon my recommendation. Um, having had, you know, extensive conversation with Mr. Mendez over the last couple of months and understanding this PD in the context of the larger plan and the LA initiatives, it's with um, complete confidence that I make the recommendation that it's cogent, it has a sound rationale, it makes sense. Ms. Merkel. So I just have two questions. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like we've had several ELA presentations. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've gone over the curriculum, we've gone over units of study, what resources were needed. So I feel like we're, to say that we haven't had is not true. To say that we haven't had any updates about ELA, because we have, at least since I've been on the board, I know we've had several conversations. Um, so I just wanted to clarify, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought we did have uh, an ELA presentation. So that's my first thing. Yeah. My second thing is just to clarify that the funds that are here that are mentioned in the agenda, um, that's not an additional taxpayer burden. That's coming out of what we've already budgeted for PD in the budget that we approved in May. So this isn't Correct. for anyone taxpayer-wise. Uh, from a financial standpoint, this is an additional funds that we're being, approving or asking for. It's already in the budget, we're just saying where it's being allocated, basically. Thank you. In our ELA presentation that we made last year, we um, stated our year one, year two, and I believe even our th year three goals. This was our year two, and we budgeted for it last year. Uh, so yes, this was presented. Yes, it's a part of our year two. Um, and no, it's not incurring an additional cost. It's something that we had already set aside for this, this point in the, in the juncture. Uh, clarification. We had actually uh, three presentations on ELA 612, January, March, and then as part of the joint committee uh, presentation. And we never did roll call vote to adopt anything. Uh, number two, um, the K-5, because there was a new supervisor coming on board, uh, one, that we're looking to see how the new supervisor impacts things, but two, the only K-5 presentation we've had in about a year was within the context of the curriculum committee and a presentation, which was a great presentation, but there were still, for me, major question marks. And that committee had not received any input from elementary school principals who know gotcha. their building, know their kids, gotcha. nor from parents gotcha. who had some very specific feedback. So just to clarify. Um, my recollection, if we're talking about the last time there was a curriculum presentation um, with both at the time ELA supervisors uh, involved, along with a bunch of other people, wasn't, I, I'm sure Julie was on it and another principal as well, right? Weren't, wasn't there at least one principal on that? On the or committee work, it was, yeah, it's mixed up, but it's okay. okay. Uh, our year two was to include, um, to, to push out. I, I think in year one, when you're thinking about curriculum development, you need the people who are teaching the content at the table. And we had, I think, close to 80 teachers sitting at the table across the grade spans. Um, so those uh, PD sessions, those curriculum development sessions, those that committee work, that really digging into 
the curriculum and the standards and looking at our needs was at an instructional level. I understand the value of the principal. I certainly understand the value of the community members. And as we move forward um, this year in our work, we will be inclusive of. Um, I think the work that we did last year was really just digging into what's being taught, what are you teaching, how are you wrapping yourself around that, how are you using the data to inform that instruction, and what are we seeing as curricular gaps. And, and that was really meaningful for the practitioner, the ones who are sitting at that planning table teaching. Yeah. Um, so that's where we began. We had all of our uh, teachers participate, well, you know, a, a large uh, portion of our teachers participate and and where we didn't have them participate we certainly went out and pushed into the buildings through those represent representatives to ask for feedback right well I'm not going to beat this to death but the feedback I had gotten um, was one that the elementary school principals have not been tapped directly and they had actually heard back from their teachers about specific needs including in areas of grammar and one of the principals I'm talking about is also a reading specialist so I'm just saying moving ahead that's critical information, not just secondary information that, that we need to tap into and get their, get their feedback. Thank you. I think I just had one other question, which was when we approved in January or December, whichever it was, that was then, that PD was then delivered. This is for yes. the next round of PD, right? Next round, yes, next, round. next level. Yep. Okay. And just so you know, part of, I'll be working with Mr. Mendez closely on the, the presentation for the second meeting in October and we will be uh, providing um, very specific information, um, including um, board motions to kind of put to rest once and for all what, what curriculum has been board approved by the board and what hasn't, because admittedly there's a lot of curriculum, there's a lot that's been reviewed, a lot that's been approved. Now, the extent to which all board members feel as if there's been um, the necessary level of uh, review is certainly subject to discussion, but you know whether or not these curriculum actually appear in board motions adopting them. I think it's important for the clarity of the, all the board. I think it's important for the clarity of the public, since we are making statements relative to whether curriculum were approved or not, that the public has a really clear picture, as reflected in board motions, what curriculum have been reviewed over the course of the last several years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dr. Cascone, if, if you can, I, I'd like to make a suggestion. Um, I, I know that Mr. Mendez has changed how um, we get the curriculum review now with your top sheet. Maybe on the top sheet or in another column, you can highlight when the presentation happened so that when we vote, we know that we're voting today on a presentation that happened last month. So if, if there's just a little, another column that says, to, yeah. Sure. Well, I, presented I, January, yeah. whenever. It was what presented. I what I can tell you is absolutely. I mean, listen, we're we're you know I think it's important that we you know, we're always reflective about our process. I will I will I will tell you honestly, you know that I've I've had a number of conversations with Ms. Mendez. Um, she shared um, her, the processes um, that they use, and I have to tell you, I think they're outstanding. Um, from a you know from a, from a, as a curriculum person. Who's, who worked as a curriculum director, I can tell you I really feel like, now, uh, in terms of, um, you know, kind of flow and sequencing and chronology, um, you know, can we get better with that? Yes, but I will tell you what I have seen in those artifacts, and we're going to be working to kind of display those for the public as well as the board in the second meeting October. I think the public will see that these are very, very sound internal procedures. Now, if we can work on the point from internal to board, I think that's what you're speaking to. Yes. And certainly we can refine that and get better with our chronology. Um, but I do think we have some excellent procedures in place. I really do. Um, I think on paper, it, it, we do appear to, Dr. Keskin, what we've discovered in, in past meetings is that there were elements of that procedure that just were left out. And in terms of uh, I'm glad you're going to be presenting things for an actual roll call vote. What used to happen is we'd have a presentation, we'd have a discussion, uh, then the next meeting we would have it as an attachment, we'd vote on it if there are any final comments, we would have, you know, the, the, in, if there are any final comments, you'd make it at that time. And so between the two, if there were things that could be, that needed to be changed, altered, whatever, adapted in a different way, phrased a different way, that change could be made. Um, but 
when I talk about things like principles not having input on something, which should be critical in the process, and when one of the principles is an ELA, is, is actually a reading specialist, these are things I heard from multiple principals, okay? So that to me is a critical part of the process. And the parents too, when you have multiple parents coming to you over uh, many years saying, my kids can't write with proper grammar, mm -hmm. and that's repeated feedback that you hear elementary, middle school, and high school, and it's not listened to, and it's not really been addressed in the curriculum, just to say, well, we'll have pull out grammar lessons, but it doesn't seem to be working. When I go to uh, Kumon in Livingston, I say, do you get a lot of people here from West Orange? Yeah, we get a lot. We find that their grammars, that, that the kids have a lot of problems with grammar too. I mean, I've actually gotten this feedback. So I hear you and I trust you and I know that you are Mr. Pedagogy, but it has not been ideal. You know, and I think that, you know, um, when you look at at, at curriculum, um, I don't. I don't think there's any place in the profession that's got it totally right, because it's challenging, right? Because you know, curriculum, a written curriculum by its nature, um, is you know is is constantly changing, by virtue of the teachable moment in the classroom. As soon as we put curriculum into a box, into a document, you know, it's it ceased to be valid because it's always evolving and the extent to which what really should be in a curriculum. How detailed should it be? There's some people that think that curriculum really should just be representative of course objectives and assessments. And the means are really differentiated by virtue of that student audience and that teacher's proclivities. So I don't think really as a profession we've actually really figured it out entirely. And so I would agree with you, Mr. Roberts, and I think it's, it's an ongoing process of refinement. You know, and I haven't been here long enough to have been in enough classrooms to see what's happening. But my initial impressions are that we're doing a lot of great things. But of course, we can I'll always improve. We can always do better. I'll agree. With um, that. And and you know, and you know, we we need to be receptive to board feedback. And you know, and if you feel as if the information is not coming in a timely fashion, if it's not coming in the manner in which you you feel you need it in order to exercise authoritative oversight. And yes, that's my job as a superintendent to work with the administration to get it to you in a format and in a way and in a chronology that makes you feel comfortable ultimately voting on it. And I'll, I promise to work with the administration to make sure that happens. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that. I, I have one more thing. Um, so for the school business um, application for absences, are, are any of the principals attending workshop this year? I know last year when Edison won the bronze certification for Future Ready, I believe that principal attended. Will the Kelly principal attend this? Okay. Yes, Dr. Pilar will be in attendance. Okay, and our registration fee um, can include up to 20 people. So I'm not sure who else is going. I know in the past, Mr. Sigi has gone for the for sustainability and other classes. I don't know if anyone else is and going. Mr. Santiago is going because I believe he he's, usually goes. Yeah, he, yeah. He usually goes for the technology mm -hmm. piece and for the Future Ready. Absolutely. And, and I know one year, um, Deb Cohen of the high school went because oh, yeah. she presented a program that we have here at the high school and that was a really proud moment for all of us to see one of our high school teachers in Atlantic City, you know, show, showing off what, you know. Our, I haven't seen, uh, you know, in reviewing all the, the school business requests, I haven't seen any other folks that okay. have put in for school boards. Um, you know, folks are attending other, you know, leadership trainings and things of that nature. Uh, but I don't believe anyone else is going to school boards. Okay, because the registration uh, includes you know, 20. 20 people. Interesting. 20 people. But, the, but it's not. But the hotels aren't free. So we may have free registration, but we, then we still have to pay the hotel. 100 bucks. Okay. Right. right yes. So there's a motion on the floor yes. at the table. Do you wish to withdraw it or do you want a second? I, I, I will vote um, based upon the fact that I, I got um, sufficient information. And, and I support the superintendent's recommendation. Yes. Gotcha. So you withdraw. All right, Mr. Calavano, let's vote. Mrs. Merklinger. Yes. Abstain and abstain for business. your business. What's that? You have to abstain, abstain for your, your business. Uh, business. Oh yeah, with take social media. <laughs> Sorry. Mr. Robertson. Yes, and abstaining for my line in the uh, business. No, Ms. I, I, number three. Ms. Trig Scales. Yes, mm -hmm. and I'm abstaining for my for business and uh, just want to point that out to Mr. Robertson uh, who alluded that or intimated or suggested 
that I may not be attending workshops. So I just want to call that to his attention. Thank uh, you. I'm glad you're attending. Vice President Mordecai? <laughs> My vote is yes, and I'm abstaining from workshop. And President Alper? Uh, yes, abstaining from my school business item. All right. Uh, finance. Mr. Special Alper. Yes. Can we just interrupt for one second? I'd um, like to just uh, thank our student liaisons. We're going to actually let them go. Uh, quickly, can we ask a question for Ms. Uh, Domenez over there? Of course. Um, uh, as a student who actually participated in the Reader's Writers Workshop uh, throughout my elementary school, um, I found that this workshop actually helped. It was very like helpful for me as a student, uh, engaging in my reading and, and writing and uh, engaging on becoming a better writer. But um, I originally started out as an ESL learner. Um, how does this like um, professional development for the teachers in literacy uh, encompass uh, ESL students and help them um, also uh, improve their writing and their reading as much as it helps the normal English-speaking students. Well, uh, first, congratulations that you are here Thank as you. a board liaison and you are articulating uh, with us um, about instruction in your second language. So, so that's, that's huge. So congratulations for that. Um, Thank you. We hope to continue to duplicate in all of our students what you've received from West Orange uh, in our ELA instruction. I think uh, what we're doing in Readers and Writers Workshop is that we're coupling that with the strategies that we're providing in professional development to our teachers who are working with ESL students, and that's called sheltered instruction. So there's two different types of professional development. There's a the professional development for the teachers who are working in the readers and writers workshop model. So what does that look like? How do we teach reading? How do we teach writing? How do we do that in a way where we foster independence? as you've um, demonstrated, right? Um, and then with our teachers who teach students that speak English as a second language, we're offering them different type of PD, and that's sheltered instruction. And that says, well now how do we reach the um, uh, acquisition level of English for those students? How do we work with our ESL population so that they can acquire the academic English that they need, so that they can uh, use different strategies in order to reach into the vocabulary of the second language or um, leverage their first language and then transfer those skills, as I'm sure you practiced that, right? Um, leveraging your first language or whatever grammar or understanding you had of your first language to learn your second language. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question as well. So I agree with Sanai, um, and I appreciate the emphasis on involving uh, training. As a student, I think it's important that we're talking about how we can kind of reconstruct the way we teach English because it's important. But beyond that, I'm also concerned about how we can make our education not just um, comprehensible but competitive. And so in today's age, some of the things that some of my peers we care about, we care about inclusive education, learning diverse perspective, we care about dynamic learning, and things that will really challenge and engage students. So how will this like um, encompass some of these ideas while also measure, measuring this impact? Because some of this is qualitative, like you can't maybe point to specific numbers. So how can we you know, gauge towards how the space is being changed for the students? Yeah, um, you know, we're really focusing on uh, equity and access. Um, that's listed as a, a few of our district goals. You'll see that language in three of our goals specifically um, that were uh, on the board agenda for tonight. Um, so we're thinking about equity, we're thinking about access. So how do we give students um, access to, um, to quality education, to quality engagement with content, and with the strategies and the resources that the students need individually so that they can all attain that curriculum at a high level. Um, today, uh, as a part of that initiative, today a group of five, uh, a group of administrators, including myself, five of us, began to attend um, training with Rutgers, it's called RISA, and it's really looking at developing equitable and sustainable systems of learning. Um, I think uh, we're at the beginning of that work as a group, as a core, as a unit. Um, but, but in today's uh, 
uh, training, for example, we really talked about the fact that equity is not something only that students need to access, but our teachers need to have equitable access into professional development, into professional learning. So when we're thinking about our system, we're thinking about it from all of the aspects for our students, how do they have equity, how do they have access, our staff, how do they have equitable access to training and resources to our content and our curriculum, how do we make sure that that's supporting um, the students based on their needs, because equity doesn't mean same, right? So I may need more than you. So are those resources available for me from my curriculum, from my text, and from the instruction that I get from my teacher, right? Um, and then systems as a whole. So today we kind of began to unpack that. So what exists in our systems that really go contra or go, go against um, all of our students accessing opportunities and succeeding in those opportunities? So something, for example, we talked about today was criteria. Here's the the very controversial, right, but criteria for honors and gifted programs, right? Is that criteria designed in a way to really um, honor and see which students are able to keep up with academic rigor or is criteria set up in a way that it keeps certain students out, right? So what are what is our system doing? What rules, if you will, is it putting in place that um, could, whether intentionally or not, keep students out of accessing high level uh, quality experiences in their educational system that really have a lot to do with the expectations that we set. Because when we set really good, high expectations for our students, you know, as we see in our 90, 90, 90 schools, 90% of the time, even with our 90% economically disadvantaged, even with our 90% um, students with um, uh, difficult situations or social and emotional uh, areas that impact their lives, 90% of them can still excel above, right? They can still exceed. So it's, I think it's how we approach that. And I think as a district, that's our priority. We're making sure that um, all of our students have access. Every group, every represented group here needs to have access to high quality education. And then we need to measure that. And so as you're saying, qualitatively, absolutely. Because not all of this is going to come from data. Right, not at least not the hard number data. It's going to come from their experiences. It's going to come from their um, um, uh, conversations. It's going to come from overcoming, right, uh, the the obstacles that life presents, and we're able to bring down what we call affect, so that I can learn, right, so that I can learn, so that I can come to school and engage, engage with the content, engage with my peers, engage with my teachers, um, in a meaningful way, so that. I become all that I am. I'm productive in all that I am, and potential is drawn out at the student's highest level. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you. Excellent questions. Thank you. To, um, you're, you're showing your chops, <laughs> and the, the reason why you're here, those were two outstanding questions, outstanding, Thanks. and really cut to the heart of things, in particular Darlene, both questions. Darlene's question, I mean, it really is the question that we as educators are, are thinking about every day that's driving us. It's the heart of the matter. Um, you know, I, because it's so complex, I've been kind of boiling it down to three things for our staff. One is data. So let data be a roadmap for us in setting our targets. Two, creating an environment where all students are, feel welcome, safe, empowered, and where their voices are heard and mattered. And the same thing for staff, an environment where all staff feel safe, feel welcome, feel empowered, um, and have the tools they need to do the job. So I'm boiling it down to those three things. And I think if we have those three things present, we're going to accomplish it. But wonderfully said, Mr. Mendez. And I'm, and I'm glad the, it was a good experience today at RISA. I know you represented us well. Folks, thanks so much. I know you probably have homework to do. So we appreciate it. Um, have a safe trip home. and. Look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Well done. Well done. And thanks to Ms. Connors. Yes, I was going to say. It was awesome. Yes. All right. Moving on. Finance, special services one through five, and business office items one through 11. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, any discussion other than my own? Uh, Mr. Calavano, on item two in. Uh, special services, uh, the 
tuition extraordinary services adjustments. I had in the back of my head that there was a three-year limit on those and not four. Am I just mistaken on that? You're right, but the 2015-16 one, we actually were fighting to see who was oh, responsible for payment, and then we got the determination that it's our responsibility, so gotcha. that's why it's here. So the we remainder tried. of my discussion on this would be my usual semi-regular diatribe that the state of New Jersey, in its infinite wisdom, allows out-of-district providers to retroactively decide that the cost of a school year for an out-of-district place student was more than they said it was at the time, and they can do that for up to three years. And they're doing that to us here for a grand total of $28,000 and change. So it's like highlighting that when I see it. Any other discussion? Yes. Um, I'd like to say both congratulations and thanks uh, to our music boosters. Um, you know. Uh, the, the, well, uh, that's number, isn't that under finance, business office, yeah, seven? Donation. They've donated, they, it took them six years to raise the money for the band trailer. Six years. It's not only, it's, and they raised, they essentially donated $29,500 to the school system. All right, that saved us money and empowered the band to do more. And those parents have been working on the build out of the inside of the band carpenters, uh, handymen, and uh, electricians, and just anybody who could do anything have been working on the build out of the trailer. Uh, you know, every evening for several weeks. And they've also, uh, people may not realize that they also built the special effects the special effects lighting of the cauldron. And I watched them as I took uh, Joelle to, to, to see Coach, uh, Coach Cheryl for cheerleading. Um, watch them daily from building this from scratch and you had a computer pro you had a computer science engineer and, and an electrician and somebody else and they were literally started with a metal husk and it turned into this elaborate uh designed cauldron with uh with the uh, uh you know the the smoke effects and and special lighting and all that and it was just really beautiful and so i just want to say uh well done to uh the pit crew that is those parents who on an ongoing basis are dedicating themselves to this effort and they're the ones every game and every competition are helping the students carry the equipment back and forth and set it up. Amazing, amazing parents, amazing kids, amazing family effort and amazing teachers. Uh, uh, the, the band leaders are just wow. That's all I can say is wow. Any other discussion? All right, then. Mr. Calavano, let's vote. Mrs. Merklinger? Yes. Mr. Robertson? Yes. Mrs. Trigg Scales? Yes. Vice President Mordecai? Yes. President Elper? Yes. All right. Up next, uh, miscellaneous items one and two for district goals and board goals. Do we want to break those out? Do we, want to, do we need to read those? What's the uh, process on those? We've read them in the past. We've read I mean, them in the past. We've read them out loud. I think we can approve number one, and then I should read number four just because it's not of the, of the board. So let's do number one on its own for district goals. Do we have a motion for those? So sure. moved. Second. All right. Happily. Under D miscellaneous. Yes. Any discussion on district goals? We're just, just happy to see that we're moving forward yep. uh, after much discussion in our workshops with both Charlene and without Charlene, our New Jersey School Board refer, uh, representative. Glad to see that we are including equity and mindfulness and all the good things we've been talking to death for years. So fin finally, so that's, that's good. All right. Mrs. Merklinger? Yes. Mr. Robertson? Yes. Mrs. Trigg Scales? Yes. Vice President Mordecai? Yes. President Alper? Yes. And on item two, the board goals, I just wanted to be able to read the fourth one because it's not on the agenda, which is to continue to participate in both individual and group professional development through attendance both at board workshops with our NJSBA field representative and offsite NJSBA trainings and to work to maintain NJSBA board certification. So with that, may I have a motion for our board goals, which are now numbered one through four. Uh, Mr. Included. Alper? Yeah. Would you talk a little bit about board certification? Ooh, we're going to save that for board reports, but we can oh. do that now. Okay. We can. Um, so, <laughs> in fact, Sandra, would you like to cover that? Because it's your uh, sure. Sure. domain. Um, <laughs> so, board professional development, um, every year there is one mandatory course, Governance One, next year governance two, three, and the year that you're reelected, whether it's your fourth year or your seventh year or your eighth year, you do governance four again, every, every reelection year. 
And so this last week, during the Essex County School Boards Association meeting, the West Orange Board of Ed received their certification for the third time. I'm not quite sure if it's the master certification or the regular certification, so that we will that will clarify at a, no, I mean in the past, because we've gotten it three times before, 2005, 2016, and now last week. So um, it, it's been such a long while since 2005 and even 2016 that I, I don't remember what kind we got, but this is the third time our entire board has been certified. So congratulations to my colleagues for working hard and attending workshops together and individually and making sure we do the work that's necessary to maintain um, to maintain our to maintain and increase our knowledge as as Dr. Cascone said earlier education continuously evolves and there's something new that we learn pretty much every every day um, so so this is good this will help us make sure that we are more informed when we make a decision hours of training over four years uh, and it has to as yes. it has to be maintained over time um, with another 10 units of training then you'll the get a master year and a half yes. we can get yeah. master which yeah. will be I and, think, and they actually the changed that it used well. to be 28 credits hmm. for the master and they downgraded it to 26 and for the individual training they added a quiz they didn't always have the quiz you just had to get 20 credits and then 40 and so, then 60. So, you know, there's, there's significant research out there that shows that boards that learn together are more effective and more effective boards have Absolutely. a positive effect on student achievement and that's the job. So it's a really good thing for us. It's so a I'm good thing. So I'm glad that we can include it in the board goals to keep that up. Yeah, I remember f my few years into the board is when the HIV came into effect. So we definitely had to get board training that year because yeah. we didn't know what HIV was yeah. back then. So it, it's something to do every year yep. and as often as you can and not just the mandated governance training for right. like HIV. And I, I'd like to see, you know, the trainings are really uh, uh, quite extensive and sophisticated from uh, sunshine law training to um, salary guide training mm -hmm. to, uh, I mean, it's, to sustainability. And uh, we, you know, we've really dedicated quite a few hours both individually and together as a board to go through that process, yeah. as well as doing board goals, which are not mandated, as well as doing board self-evaluation, which used to be mandated by law and is not now, but right. we went, went through the process. Good practice. So congratulations. And I believe uh, negotiations, as you just mentioned, is what Ms. Trigg Scales is actually going to take in a few weeks. Good. Um, Mr. Alper excellent. and Mr. Mendez and, and I sustainability. And Wonderful. sustainability is excellent. Yeah. And social emotional learning. Very That's nice. excellent, yeah. yeah. Mr. Alper and Mr. Mendez and I took uh, negotiations earlier this year, the ready, set, bargain training. <laughs> You have taken and that and we're in the midst of that now, so it's year. very necessary. All right. Yeah. So, let's move this. All right. May I have a motion? Motion. Second. <laughs> Mr. Calabano. Mrs. Merklinger? Yes. Mr. Robertson? Yes. Mrs. Trigg Scales? Yes. Vice President Mordecai? Yes. President Alper? Yes. Okay, public comment. If you have anything to say, come on up. You'll have three minutes. Let us know your name and address. And you left three minutes on the clock, which I already said. <laughs> Hello, I'm Susan Maccabee, Two Mountain Way. Um, I understand that there's a new food policy regarding parents bringing in food into the building, and but I've heard different versions from different people, like we can't have bake sales, we can't have pretzel sales, but is it just inside? Oh, we can have pretzel, we have bake sales outside, but maybe not. And a whole bunch of things like, does that affect us? Like for the Halloween party, can we have food there? If it's, can we buy food from the cafeteria and bring that to the party? So I have a lot of, you know, I'm not on the executive board, so I guess I didn't get the memo. I just know that there's a lot of changes that way that affect what I need to do for my kids and for my school this year. And I just would like the whole policy so I could understand like, I know that the foot, but football games, I think it's parents provide the food there. How does it all work? That's all I wanted to know is what's allowed in the school? Why has it changed? And um, what do we do going forward? Just so that I know I'm doing the right thing. Thank you. Mr. Alper, would you mind? No, not at all. Thank you so much for coming up to speak about that. And, and I appreciate it. Um, I think it's, it, it speaks to the need for, for me to put out uh, some form of a, a correspondence to the parents. 
Um, you know, we've we've had some some um, you know some 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 activi activism of late um, from you know our parents of students with life threatening allergies. Um, we've had some really productive meetings with representatives of that group. It's really kind of I think raised the level of awareness um, of a need to really develop an allergy uh, management plan, a board of education policy, and corresponding regulations. This is really the plan. So, you know, in the absence of that to date, and we are moving expeditiously on getting that passed, um, this has been my recommendation to principals. We need to be aware, very aware, of the students in our buildings who have these life-threatening allergies and what those are. We need to ensure that all staff members that work with those students, we need are aware of that. We need to make sure that all the parents of children who are in those classrooms, obviously discreetly, not identifying the student, are aware of that. Um, what I have recommended for bake sales is that um, that as principals that you, you bring in representatives from of parents who have students with life-threatening allergies and have a, an inclusive collaborative conversation with those parents because those parents don't want to bring about changes that are going to really put a crimp in, in other folks, you know, students' lifestyle and, and be party poopers, so to speak. They just want to ensure and feel comfortable that their students and their children are safe. So bring parents in. Have an inclusive conversation with them. Say, hey, listen, we'd like to do a bake sale. We'd love to actually be able to have homemade baked goods. Could, how could we do that and ensure that you're comfortable and that your kids are safe? So one example would be to make sure that the ingredients, you know, at a bake scale are very clearly listed. Um, that, um, you know, that if you have ingredients that, that may have allergens in them, that you don't have cross-contamination. So this is something we're really focusing on. I think in the interim, what I've asked principals to do is follow protocol that's been used, but use your judgment and really enfranchise these parents who are coming that from perspective into the conversation. And I'll tell you, they will give you a lot of information and they'll help you guide through it. Um, but it's not our intention to kind of shut everything down, but rather just to really make sure that these students are safe and are not put into situations where they're going to be in, in harm's way. But more clarity forthcoming, and I will be putting out a correspondence to parents to give them a little bit of information on that. So thank you so much. Is there anyone further for public comment? Seeing none, um, yeah, I mean, that sounds completely reasonable. I would be, you know, very concerned if we were losing, you know, things like bake sales, holiday parties, and, you know, like the International Food Days where families, you know, cook at home foods from their countries of origin and bring them in, and, you know, it's a big thing some schools do. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that can be worked out and the conversations can be had quickly and we don't find that, you know, people are missing out on bake sales and, and everything else because that wouldn't be great. And I'm, I'm glad to note that I, I am meeting with the, the elementary principals, which is really the group for which this is really relevant. I'm meeting mm -hmm. with them tomorrow, um, and this is an item on the agenda. So I think I can provide some clarity where there isn't kind of a knee-jerk and extremist reaction, um, as might be the case in some buildings, but that we're just being judicious and measured in how we approach it. All right. Uh, board member reports. Ms. Trig Scales. Well, good evening again, everyone. And so I think this is the 14th day of school. Does that sound about right? And the 11th week that we've had Dr. Cascone as our superintendent. I think that's about right. I think. I think. But who's counting? And, and I, I just think it's wonderful. I mean, his exuberance is catching. Uh, your expertise is welcomed. And... You're managing 12 schools, central office staff, 7,000 students, 100 plus staff, and a host of requests from your board. Um, I'm just so impressed with the communications and the morale seems to be rising and the confidence and trust seem evident. And so I'm just happy you're here. And I think this marriage is off to a very good start. And we hope the honeymoon lasts a very long time. <laughs> and I, I, I should have said this when the liaisons were here, but um, our young people are our precious, precious jewels, 
aside from being our future, and um, we want to educate them well because they'll also be our caretakers. Um, what happened on Friday with the global climate strike around the world was just amazing with this 16-year-old um, Swedish young lady, Greta Thurburn. And we had a group here from West Orange who participated as well. And just so heartwarming to see that kids are making a difference. Um, we adults in so many ways have um, messed things up and it, it's going to take these bright, intuitive young people to straighten it out um, for us and for them and for our future. Um, and saving our environment is really, really important, and that's kind of a segue. Um, I've been participating lately with our green West Orange because I've become a tree hugger. I guess I've always been a tree hugger, but um, I'm really a tree hugger now since my trees were affected. But there's going to be a um, Rawway River cleanup, and it's going to um, run from the high school the uh, Degnan Park, Vincent's Pond, I didn't know that was the name of the pond, Vincent's Pond, all the way out to McLoon's. And they will be asking our high school students to participate in the cleanup. And I just think that's such a wonderful thing that um, it's gonna be a community event. And so I wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that. It's coming up soon. And then I went to the Pedestrian Safety Committee um, for Ms. Mordecai. And um, they talked about new stop signs have gone up all around our schools. I've, I've noticed them in my neighborhood near the high school. And there's also going to be a bike rodeo uh, this Wednesday from 6 to 7 at Washington School. And it's all about safe bike skills. So if you have little ones uh, who are just learning or who need a refresher on how to give hand signals and all that kind of stuff, they can show up at Washington School on Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you. Ms. Mordecai. See, when Dr. Cascone and I went to that meeting, we didn't have any bike rodeos. We didn't have the fun stuff. But I'm um, <laughs> sort of very jealous. Um, I am looking forward to that Rawway River cleanup, and that would be something the Sustainability Committee would have been involved with, with the Environmental Commission of the town. As oh, it didn't happen yet. It's coming and also our fight for Green Club at the high school and the many environmental clubs that we have throughout the district. That would be something great for them to, to take up. Um, I guess my, my border for it is, um, uh, on Saturday I attended um, New Jersey School Boards Association, uh, County Association leadership meeting, and it was my last meeting, so it was bittersweet. Nobody knew it was my last meeting, including me, because they decided to not have a November meeting. So it was great to have 21 counties represented this past Saturday in Trenton, and they talked a lot about, um, actually they had the same visitors we had from before, just before school started. Um, Dr. Heindel, as well as Liz Warner, talking about social emotional learning and really pushing that forward statewide. So that was a great place for them to be because they had 21 counties represented there. And I'm looking forward to us as a district hosting them with a schools support network mm -hmm. and everything else that they're doing because that would be beneficial to all our faculty Absolutely. and staff. Yeah. And that's it for me. All right. Easy weekend. Mr. Robertson. Lots of driving. First, I just want to say, uh, as uh, Mr. Scales pointed out, Dr. Cascone, you made an immediate difference. I uh, just want to thank you for, uh, for that exuberance, for that just constant stream of positivism, great communication, and, and you have already made a difference in, uh, in morale as well. Uh, and just want to thank you for, uh, uh, for being off to a great start. I know it's been taking a lot of hard work. It's like drinking water from a, from a fire hose, I know. Um, uh, the Nikhil, uh, the, the walk run uh, for Nikhil was uh, another wonderful uh, both celebration of our community and reminder of, of, of uh, traffic safety and, not, and, and, and uh, driving without being distracted. And um, I, was, I, was, uh, I, of course, did the, I did the walk part, not the run. <laughs> Although my son Jared came back, he said I, you know, he wanted to do the run again. And, 
And uh, he was bummed he came in second last year. He came in third this year. So it's like I said, you're getting older. So he didn't like that. But um, uh, but it was a lot of fun. It was just the, it's one of the events I think that really pulls everybody in the community together, regardless of, of anything. It's just nothing but warmth and love, and it's it's a beautiful event. I want to you know thank Sangeeta and Sunil. Uh, it's always wonderful. Um, had attended uh, Liberty Back to School Night where I saw Dr. Cascone. And um, uh, for us, it was uh, our, our, you know, Joelle's eighth grade now. It's our second time around at Liberty. And, and we're, we feel lucky that uh, she got a couple of uh, the teachers that we loved before when Jared was there with uh, uh, Mr. DeJesus and, and Ms. Patel. Uh, Mr. DeJesus, an amazing science teacher, Ms. Patel, great math teacher, who also, by the way, speaks six languages. Um, yeah, she's just kind of brilliant. And, um, and Ms. Yu came back for Chinese, and, and, uh, but also met some just, I just was blown away by the outstanding talent uh, among the teachers, and, and from uh, uh, Dr. Gordillo to always Mr. Sanfi and Mr. Music himself, and Ms. Horowitz, and uh, it was just a wonderful experience. Um, and uh, what else? Guidance, I had a couple of questions on a few things. Oh, oh the, were you going to talk about the, uh, our, the Essex County, you talked about the certification. Were you going to talk about the, uh, the safety panel? Like. Okay. Well, they had, a, uh, they had an amazing uh, safety and security panel at the uh, Essex, County, Essex County School Board Association meeting where we got the training certification. The good news is that you know, we were doing a lot of things right already or certainly begun uh, with, the, with the security audit. Um, there are other resources that we can look into that are free. Uh, Lou uh, Camerata, special investigator, regional planner, and representative on preparedness and emergency planning. Uh, he, you know, he and his team will come out and do trainings for us, and uh, they do, you know, trainings and credentials and all sorts of things and certifications, ongoing certifications for a variety of areas. And they also do have some grants available, but they provide a host of free services. So I'll pass along his his contact information to you. There's also Valerie Wilson, uh, the BA, who's overseeing a billion dollar budget for New York City Public Schools, and she's always just pretty incredible. Uh, she was talking about how when we think of uh, planning for specific crises, they have students, some students who are in crisis every day, whether it's with PTSD and varieties of needs and the types of things that they have to implement to make sure they're meeting daily needs. And then when the water crisis first uh, hit New York City Public Schools, how they literally overnight uh, were able to get bottled waters in the thousands into all the schools uh, after getting, she gets a call at midnight. And, uh, you know, it was uh, really wonderful to hear the different stories. And Dave Rubin, uh, Director of Safety Services for Belleville. Um, I'm not going to go into detail. I'll send you some notes later. But there were some things that the others were doing more of or doing that we may not be doing or, may sh or should possibly look at, as well as the uh, free services and support uh, that uh, uh, Lou Camerata talked about. But it was a very informative experience. It was a great discussion panel and um, all around good event. Sorry? Okay, uh, and just had a couple of quick, yes, yes. In addition, Officer Ed was there from the West oh, Orange Police Department. Duh. Our SRO. Absolutely, our SRO was there. So. He was there live, and that was wonderful that we had that active participation. Mm -hmm. And we were the only district with our SRO officer there, so that was awesome. That was awesome, <laughs> that was awesome. Um, couple quick questions on some, just follow up on some things. Um, and Mrs. Mordecai, I think, brought this up as well. And you, you sent us some information kind of updating on the guidance audit, but that's something we should have a larger discussion about. That was a major kind of turnaround point for guidance and addressing, and, and it'd be good to know more about how we're expanding those efforts in more detail for K-8, because uh, that was the, where the big challenge was, or K-5 especially, where there really wasn't uh, a guidance presence, especially since one of your focuses and something that's dear to my heart is early career development, early college exploration, um, as well as looking at how they met the needs that were identified in the survey, because uh, parents provided a wealth of information. Uh, and that's been an area that's been very uh, 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 important to me over the past few years, because initially I had brought forth 
uh, letters from parents on very specific things. And uh, I'd like to know also more about the training they're getting to better meet the needs of uh, uh, for college applications because we found that some had more experience or some were better trained than other guidance counselors and kids were getting a variety of direction and not always what they needed. Mo our guidance counselors are very dedicated, very loving and overall great, uh, but you know we're in continuous improvement uh, from mindset so we can always, always do better, especially when we're helping to direct kids' uh, lives. I'm sorry? Did you want to make, okay. Uh, the other question I was going to ask about had to do with um, when we can, uh, right before graduation, and you know, my son graduated this year, I had received kind of anecdotal reports. Uh, we knew that our graduation rate was the best ever, 91.5%, but I had received anecdotal reports about uh, our college attendance rates increasing for two year, four year, and in total. Um, and it would be great to see the actual data as well as get that final list. I got the, app, I got the acceptance list, but not the actual attendance list. It would be great to actually see that and the data and um, to then also look at how we're doing in terms of uh, from a, a both a gender and ethnicity standpoint. One of the positives over the past few years is that girls were taking uh, a lead role in winning many of the science and math awards, particularly last year and the year before, but still holding their own this year. And that was so where a lot of districts struggle with girls, our girls were excelling, um, including uh, Sinai's uh, uh, sister. And, um, you know, and now I'm wondering, you know, how are our boys doing, particularly boys of color? Um, and it would be great to maybe step one is just get the data as to how we did, because that's also a PR story that we can put out there, um, good news story. And then second is getting the data as to how we're doing from an equity standpoint, equity and access standpoint, So, which I know that you're pulling together gradually. But if we get that first part soon, that would be great. Yeah, I owe you, uh, I've only provided a sketch of the college information forthcoming this week. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, I, I, heard, I got your, your inquiry and uh, more details coming. And I owe you an attachment, which I left off the last report, so. Wonderful. In, checks in the mail. Checks in the mail, <laughs> wonderful. You're good for it, I know, it's all right. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Marklinger. So I just want to echo my peers. Um, Scott, I think you've been a great addition. and. Uh, definitely love the positivity that you've been bringing to West Orange and our school districts. Um, you know, I was up at the high school on Thursday night and I just took a moment to just look around and there were so many students, so many kids just from the community engaged in some sort of activity. It was just a great thing to see. We had girls soccer, the boys soccer team was warming up, we had football going on, baseball, tennis. I mean, the entire football was practicing, we had cheerleaders up there. I mean, it was just massive numbers of people, but everyone was just working together, everyone sharing the fields, um, using the facilities. So it was just a great thing to see West Orange High being used in that capacity by the community. So um, definitely uh, want to just point out, if you aren't on social media, to check out uh, the West Orange Instagram, Facebook pages. We've been flooding, or it's been flooded with just so many different and amazing events that our schools, our teachers and students are doing between car washes, um, athletic events, the marching band, um, just so many things that are going on. It's so great to see, and there's way too many to put into one little report. Um, but just, you know, if you haven't gotten out there or checked out uh, social media, definitely check out our West Orange pages. Um, there's a lot going on. Um, the C.J. Morgan golf outing is Monday, so if you aren't registered to join, I'm sure you can still join in. They're always looking for folks. Um, we have our back to school nights. Uh, the high school one uh, is this Thursday. There's no school on Monday, and I believe and on to. the yep. uh, October 1st and 9th. Um, but one thing I just want to point out um, real quick, uh, something that's near and dear to my heart is the, um, and I really appreciate the girls volleyball team is uh, holding um, with their games from about four o'clock, um, a suicide prevention awareness um, it's dedicated to suicide prevention awareness, and so the more folks that can come out to support that, that would be great. So, really appreciate it. What day is it? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. 
Oh, the awful. girls' volleyball. That's girls right. volleyball. I've got a Girl Scout meeting, unfortunately. But. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it, it's tough to be in a lot of places. We have so many things going on. I find myself Saturday, I was running around all over West Orange between different sporting events and same thing on Sunday. So, yeah. you know, there's just so many events, which is great. It's just hard to be all in one place, every place at one time. So. Yeah, there's been a ton. Uh, Dr. Cascone and I, and I obviously echo everyone else on your presence, uh, but Dr. Cascone and I hit a bunch of them this Saturday and Sunday uh, to Saturday, I guess. Uh, we were at the Gregory Car Wash, although separately, we were at the Hazel Carnival, we were at the other thing. But what I wanted to talk about was, and you probably can't tell at this point a week later, That's sadly, but uh, Saturday the 14th, I guess it was, we both had our head shaved for childhood cancer research at St. Baldrick's at the Shillelagh. Uh, together between the two of us, we raised just under $1,600, which is good. But I want to give a shout out to a teacher in the district, Meredith Schwartz, who also had her head shaved, which is obviously a much bigger commitment than us relatively bald guys to begin with. Definitely. She has I'm raised just over $8,000, wow. which is incredible. Wow. So. Very nice. Hats and hair off to her. And that's all I've got. Uh, next board meeting will be just, right here. Go ahead. I just want to note that there is a Love and Unity concert Saturday at OzPAC. I mm. think it's from 12 to 6. Um, and our students are participating, the Asian Club, the African Heritage Club, mm -hmm. and the Unity Club. And it's a free event and lots of different music and uh, vendors. Yeah. So come on out and do another We Are West Orange thing. All right. I have to say that I attended the St. Baldrick event, and um, I, I, I won't tell you that they both cried, but I, 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 I was crying watching them get their heads shaved, saying, we no, fine. not me, but their hair grew right I think back. you guys look good Within that a couple way. days, I mean, their hair grew back. You know, but, um, it's... I'm just pretty happy with shades it. Shades of I mean, difference. It's yeah. okay. It's but, I, but I will, I will add my, or the, the love fest for Dr. Cascom. So, thank you. Can I add one? Good more, so far. One more shout out sure. Yeah, sure. or thing to um, if Saturday night, if you happen to be watching the Mets game, look out for our West Orange oh, cheerleaders. Right. Oh, cool. They will be performing yes. at uh, City yes. Field City in the. Field. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they do a dance and cheer night and so our west orange students who range from ages 6 to 14 will be performing wow awesome. coach cheryl has been working them out very nice <laughs> she's been working them hard fantastic all right we'll see you here 8 p.m october 7th we're adjourned thank you